Welcome, um, Bill, are you ready to, to be recording? Yes, okay. Welcome to Light Verse in Dark Times. This is week four. Um, I've been enjoying this so much. And as in every other week, we have a fantastic lineup today. Um, before we get started, a little promo for next week. And I will try to remember to do this again at the end for, for anyone who's arriving late. Um, next week, Sunday, May 24th, our readers will be Robert Crawford, Midge Goldberg, Jean L. Creeley, Leslie Mansour, Christopher Scribner, and Karen Peterson. So we're looking forward to that. And today, we also have a fantastic lineup. Um, and we are going to... Um, go in alphabetical order today, which seems to be um, both easy for me to remember and also a nice balance of material and reading styles and so on. Um, I am delighted and honored to welcome the brilliant Barbara Crooker. Barbara has published 12 chapbooks and nine full-length books of poems. Some Glad Morning, Pit, it, from the Pitt Poetry Series is her latest. Again, that's Some Glad Morning. She's been a light contributor since the days of John Mella, when it was a print journal. And she has appeared in many anthologies, including Love Songs at the Villanelle, um, edited by Marilyn L. Taylor, who is with us today. Um, Nasty Women Poets, an unapologetic anthology of subversive verse. Um, co-edited by Julie Kane, who is also here today, and the Bedford Introduction to Literature. Uh, recently, Barbara Crooker won the Pandemic Poetry Contest sponsored by Garrison Keeler with her poem, Quarantine Villanelle. <laughs> she, she lives, writes, and gardens in rural Northeastern Pennsylvania, where voluntary isolation is not that different from her pre-pandemic life. Um, Barbara's website is www.barbaracrooker, that's C-R-O-O-K-E-R.com. And Barbara, please take it away. You have to unmute yourself, sorry. A reminder to all of you readers, um, since you will be muted initially, you gotta unmute. All right. So this is the latest poem that I have had in light, and thank you, Melissa, and also thank you for doing this series. This has been really a delightful way to spend Sunday afternoons. Uh, so this was the poem of the week this week. The title is 2020. We've stayed inside for 60 days. We've changed our habits many ways. We can't give Mother's Day bouquets and now come murder hornets. We've washed our hands till they are sore. We've scrubbed the counters, mopped the floor. We've wiped the knob on every door. And now it's murder hornets. We hide our mouths behind a mask. We double think each mundane task. What else can we do now, you ask? Look out for murder hornets. We live this life in quarantine, away from friends who can't be seen. We spend our days glued to a screen and fear the murder hornets. One day, restrictions will be over, but will we wander in the clover and play a game of catch with Rover? Hell no. Thanks, murder hornets. <laughs> So this is one. Uh, remember the days of yore when we used to submit with paper and envelopes and stamps before submittable? Okay, so this is a sh little haiku about that. Oh wait, all haikus are little haikus. <laughs> Forefinger sliced open by rejection slip, the cruelest cut of all. <laughs> This one is with apologies to Elizabeth Bishop, Artless. The art of blurbing isn't hard to master. Pick three, three quick phrases, fill them in with quotes, so full of compliments, they're thick as plaster. 
So what if all of this just seems like bluster? Don't try to separate the sheep from goats. The art of blurbing isn't hard to master. No ideal reader lets this book go past her. Use adjectives like luminous, but note the compliments have strata, layers, plaster. A clever tone, some irony for good measure will cover up the fact that it's all bloat. The art of blurbing isn't hard to master. Your own true thoughts, they're open to conjecture. Keep going, build your sentences by rote. Slap those compliments sky high, go faster. Just keep on going like a telecaster who believes in every word he ever wrote. The art of blurbing is not hard to master. The compliment's so thick, it's cracked like plaster. <laughs> Something else we've been doing in um, isolation is watching the CBS family movies. And this is an older poem of mine, but uh, last week, uh, Forrest Gump was shown again. Okay, this is Forrest Gump contemplates William Carlos Williams. In the end, I reckon it were the chicken what glazed that red wheel barra, not the rain. And then this one, again, apologies, William Carlos Williams. I hope I never meet you uh, in the afterlife. This is, um, it, it, this did happen about 20 some years ago, but they remade Emma and they called it Clueless. And in this, Alicia Silverstone had the lead role. She played Cher. And most of her dialogue was in Val, Val talk or Valley Girl talk, also known as Upspeak. So everything ends in a question. Alicia Silverstone meets William Carlos Williams. This is like, just to say, you know those plums in the refrigerator that you were saving for breakfast? Whatever. They were like, so delicious, so sweet, and you know, so cold. And then I'll end with a poem uh, back from um, when John Mella uh, took poems in the print version. And this was taken from a New York Times headline, apparently after a, a fraternity party that had really gotten out of hand. So the headline and the title of the poem is Sigma News Ban Alcohol at Frat Parties. The Sigma News say no to booze. Oh, what will happen next? The beta pies are going dry, a domino effect. Fidelts were first to say that thirst should now be quenched by soda. The Epsilons will march along the prohibition order. John Belushi's feeling woozy, rolling in his grave. The Teeks and Deeks and all the Greeks are learning to behave. The library's the place to be instead of at a keg. Use your computer, get a tutor, raise those grades a peg. To parents who are paying huge tuition, happy days. Instead of raising steins and mugs, they'll raise their GPAs. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing, Barbara. Thank you so much. What a great reading. Thank yeah. you. Oh my. Um, as you can tell, I briefly unmuted everyone so you could applaud. I'm going to re mute you. I introduce yeah, our next reader. Where was. Okay, sorry, re muted. Um, again, thank you, Barbara, for that tremendous reading. Um, our next reader is David Gala. David. I'm sorry, did I say David? I'm misspeaking. I'm naming the wrong member of the Galef family to my great chagrin. Another talented member, Daniel Galef, is one of those good for nothing millennials you keep hearing articles about. He has published over 300 poems in Able Muse, Measure, Philosophy Now, and of course, Light, 
which accepted his first published poem in its last print issue back in 2012. This makes him, he is told, the youngest poet to publish in the journal and also set a troubling precedent of print magazines folding immediately after he appears in them. He also writes short stories, humor, and plays, and has just had a story awarded a spot in the upcoming 2020 Best Small Fictions Anthology. Um, and um, thank you so much for being with us, Daniel, and I hope you will take it away. Are you sure? I'm sure I could probably still get David Galef on the horn. <laughs> All right. Um, so I will start with a request, just because it's very flattering to get a request. This was published, of course, in Light Quarterly, now Light, a few years ago. Um, it had a title originally, I'm just going to call it Orange. I loose the bolt and ope the door hinge, looking for a rhyme for Orange. I'll hunt at last until I score in just the place a rhyme for Orange. Till then, I'll, like a carnivore, ingest the fruit of no more orange. If I start now, in April or in June, will I have rhymed the orange? It's rarer than the kohi nor in Jehan's court, this rhyme for orange. Could it be, there are no more? In jest, I ask, a twin for orange shall be found. Yes, rhymes galore in joke books lurk to pair with orange. I'll find the oath that Brutus swore in Julius Caesar, ere rhyme orange. Find Poe's lost Lenore before ingeniously I rhyme with orange. I've pried apart each flower's sporange. Still I seek the rhyme for orange. From the obelisk at Gorange to the purple peaks of Blorange, Everest, McKinley, or Rinjani, I will rhyme the orange. But till then, I won't rest nor enjoy a tasty unrhymed orange, wedging more and ever more enjambment just to rhyme with orange. Uh, that one obviously rhymes with orange. I probably should have explained some of the names. A lot of the proper names are things that actually do exist and rhyme with orange that I scared up just for the poem. Um, let's see, what's next? How about a sonnet? I've been writing a sonnet series for a couple of years based on an 1888 book by Eugene Lee Hamilton. And this is one of the lighter light verse sonnets from that collection. Andalusia to Ampeto, and who those are don't matter because I don't know either. It's about being famous. You'll think yourself a marble bust, your slate, and every creep and critic is a sponge who with one single swipe across your pate remakes it as their own so they can lunge full tilt at wheeling windmills with your voice and knock them over, pin the crime on you, and leave you limp with little other choice but shrug and laugh, what are you going to do? This gruesome sport is fortune's favorite game. She'll steal your soul, that mindless, worshipped elf, until all that remains an empty name that rests uncut, gilt-edged, upon some shelf. Thus I've heard told the crippling curse of fame. Uh, but still, I'd like to find out for myself. <laughs> then, last time, quite a lot of people read a COVID poem. And I don't really have one. It's not something that I've felt the need to write, but here's something that came out rather ominously in January and then only became true much later. This was when the first reports were coming in, and also we all thought we were going into World War III with Iran. It's a parody of a Robert Frost poem that I probably don't have to explain to this illustrious crowd called Bombs and Plague. Some say the world will end with nukes, some say with plague. If at the hand of cackling kooks we must go, I would go with nukes. But if a war is too quick, too vague, too on the nose, then maybe you would skip those trials at The Hague. The flu would do, and go by plague. And then, oh, it's only been three minutes. I might have to go with other poems I haven't prepared. This one is The Phrenologist's Other Trade, which I'm sure was also light. Uh, I'll set the scene. Everyone knows what phrenology is, a sort of 19th century pseudoscience where the professor would feel the bumps on your head and tell you your character. You've got a great sense of humor. You're musical and then pay you more to tell you more. 
or charge you more. So this is the phrenologist's other trade. All right, you're done. Your hat und off now. What's that? Ah, just a dueling scar. Well, never mind, but don't you scoff now. The bumps determine who you are. And if you'd like a little extra, if you need a little more, more wealth, respect, a little sex, traditionally a point that's sore, my other trade's not just a rumor. Do you anger easily? Want a better sense of humor? Do people find you weaselly? If so, just step behind this curtain, read off your hat, your glasses too. But uh, first be absolutely certain you would like a better you. And boy, they won't be laughing then. But th this hammer won't pay any heed. Now close your eyes and count to 10 and we'll install the bumps you need. That's a poem that comes with a prop. Um, <laughs> I can't hear anyone, this is crazy. I'm just reading to myself, which of course I do every day anyway. Here is, uh, let's see. Some people last time were reading poems that weren't theirs. And so I thought I might end, if it is time to end, with this uh, German sonnet by Friedrich Hölderlin, which I've always been a fan of. Wenn ging der Schwoll und wann abschwoll es geht, man klügt bewahn, zu glieben an dem Wies und weder nach ein paar zu sausen hieß, komm nicht der Schwan sich noch beträumen hätte. Ach, betraume, glickt für sich die Hummels an, wo gleich den Öser prägt mit Schwab und Voll, aus Bremischhopfen klängelt, als der Gan und schrockt er Tschischerwurf, zu saften wo. Er treulichen vor greizig Achisten wie totisch Kanix in der Kreu begroft. Typ Grablei treppisch waren oper dann schmuck die Zappen. Alles von hieß, wenn wie auf dem Bleck von mir und ihn geschwühen, kennst du das Land, wo die zu Thronen blühen? It's a lovely little poem in a lovely language. Or, or maybe it's nonsense, I can't remember. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, uh, it's true, it's nonsense. <laughs> Thank you so much for that reading, Daniel. <laughs> um, that was terrific. Um, and I was very excited to hear the orange poem read live. So thank you. Thank you for indulging me. Um, our next reader, I'm very excited to welcome Claudia Gary. And Claudia, just I, I can see that you're not unmuted yet. So do remember to unmute yourself. Um, before I'm sorry, I'm adjusting, I'm adjusting the iPad, sorry. Okay, that's fine. You have a minute because I'm going to introduce you. Okay. Um, Claudia Gary's poems appear in journals and anthologies internationally. They first appeared in Light's predecessor, Light Quarterly. Um, it's been a continuum. Um, same magazine, different format, different editor, no. um, around 1999. She teaches workshops on the Villanelle, the sonnet, and poetic meter, as well as a course on the science of poetry at the Writers' Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and you can find info at writer.org. But since these are all currently held on Zoom, right now you can take her workshops and courses from anywhere in the world, even in your pajamas. Claudia also writes chamber music and health slash science articles. Her 2006 full-length collection, Humor Me, which is approximately 50% serious, is still available from Amazon. Her more recent chapbooks, including Bikini Buyer's Remorse, Epicurograms, and Genetic Revisionism, are available from Claudia via email, which you'll find on her webpage, um, pw.org slash content slash Claudia underscore Gary. You can also follow her on Twitter at, at Claudia Gary. Um, so Claudia, I look forward to reading again. Please unmute yourself before you start. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much, Melissa. It's a pleasure to be among such wonderful poets and um, thank you to everyone who tuned in. Uh, like, quarterly and light 
poetry magazine have been a, you know, a cherished part of my life for many years. Um, I'm going to start and end with poems about the human face. The first one is from Humor Me, my 2006 book, and it's called Midlife Interrogation. Are you now or have you be ever been attractive? Even as this fortune settles in, you know its interest won't be retroactive. Before time pounces, he must go exploring. With teasing lines, he takes you for a spin. So seductive, you almost think your face is worth restoring. And then another little poem about aging uh, from the same book. This is called Colorization on the Revival of the Miniskirt. At 21, her legs could stun. At 40, they're no duller. The difference is, for the rerun, they're shown in Technicolor. Um, speeding right along. I'm just reading, I'm mostly reading short poems. These uh, next couple are from uh, Bikini Buyer's Remorse chapbook. Um, clothes make the musician. I believe this appeared in white. Clothes make the musician. Protege, dear, skip the brassiere and bear your shoulders, toes. Now hold that deafening pose and have no fear. Critics won't hear the burblings and mutterings your bow makes on the naked strings. And um, then also from uh, Bikini Buyer's Remorse, this is called Slip of a Sonnet. It's a, it's a sonnet in um, monometer, one foot per line, slip of a sonnet. About to lose your muse, you pout and shout profuse adieus without an ear for note or phrase and here promote malaise. It was a Petrarchan. Um, next, uh, from Epicurograms. This epicurograms and other morsels. Uh, Ode to an everything bagel. Delicious inclusivity, whose mound of hummus or cream cheese with Nova Scotia complements seeds, grains, onion strips, well browned. I don't care whether you're halal or kosher and ageism too old to be a protege or groupie she's valueless in dollar euro rupee <clears throat> her talents have matured her voice is clear no other can take credit now poor dear um and this is this is a villanelle called blues monkey I've suffered, but I can't quite sing the blues. My troubles are occasional, not chronic. My angst is true, but not the kind you'd use against the everyday to find or lose your heart. My chords are major and harmonic. I've suffered, but I don't dare sing the blues. Any attempt would probably amuse, but not in ways your songs have made, like, made iconic. Your angst is true, while mine's Nothing to use in threatening to blow a major fuse or skip to Paris on the supersonic. I've not suffered enough to sing the blues. Saying I have is asking for a bruise. You'll throw tomatoes. They'll be hydroponic. This angst is true, but nothing I can use to make you say mine is the pain you choose. The plates I spin are porcelain not, te not tectonic. I suffer from a need to sing the blues with, that, with insufficient angst, too kind to use. Uh, and then this is called Frizz, which appeared in poetry. I mean, this appeared in, not poetry, this appeared in light. <laughs> uh, frizz. Your mother said to straighten it and then add goo and curlers. Your classmates didn't care a bit except the punks and twirlers. 
Your girlfriends asked to play with it, then offered kind suggestions. Your enemies made fun of it and asked the rudest questions. Your boss says only keep it neat. Your colleagues claim they love it. The talk shows say you'll feel complete with hair that others covet. Your women friends say shape it. Your man friend isn't saying. Now classmates plead just color it so no one knows we're aging. We're graying, sorry. I missed the rhyme, graying. Um, and um, from Genetic Revisionism, which is the newest chapbook. Um, video call, very close to home. Video call, you are not here. I am not there. You try and fail to muss my hair. You, uh, uh, to no avail, we stare and stare till eyes go blear. It's so unfair. Um, and Kurzweil's Conundrum, which is about Ray Kurzweil, who's a uh, promoter of transhumanism. There was once an inventor named Ray who so wanted to lengthen his stay that his brain booked a chip on a silicon chip in a cyborg. But Ray, he's away. And uh, finally, uh, I'm going to read the other poem about the human face. And this is what's, this is actually has been in uh, Light Poems of the Week this past week, it's there today. Um, it's called Imago Viri, um, which is Latin for but either image of man or image of virus, same, same spelling. Um, and it's addressed to the lawmaker who opposed coronavirus face masks because they cover, quote, the image of God, unquote. Imago Viri. What holy protector anointed with nectar your head's frontal sector? If you're his reflector, I don't mean to Hector, but is God a vector? That's it for me. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. I, I didn't even realize that about the title um, of your last poem, I'm embarrassed to say. So thank you for um, enlightening me. That's, that's really cool. I like it even more now. Um, our next reader is Chris O'Carroll. Chris was a virtually unknown stand-up comic when he self-published Take These Rhymes please, rude limericks and other crimes against literature, and began hawking that volume at comedy clubs. From toking on limericks, it was a short step to, main, to mainlining sonnets, and he soon became a virtually unknown poet. He has been a featured poet at Light, where his collection, The Jokes on Me, was hailed as a hilarious book, an erudite one, and truly moving. His work appears in The Best of the Barefoot News, Love Affairs at the Villanelle, and The Great American Wise Ass Poetry Anthology. Chris, please take it away. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Since this is a light verse in dark times reading, let's start with a poem specifically about these dark times we are all living through, times that are so severely testing the limits of malice and incompetence as an effective leadership strategy. This is Make America's Death Toll Great. Now that he's not holding rallies, how can we express defiance of the social distance rules that denigrate our self-reliance? Democrats are nanny staters who arouse our indignation. Let's breathe on each other at an anti-lockdown demonstration. When, we, when he contradicts the science, that's a message to inspire us. He's a president to die for in your face, coronavirus. 
And I think that's just about enough of that. <laughs> Let's spin the dial to a Beatles song. Actually, this poem started life as a Beatles song, and then I reworked it as a sonnet. This is Norwegian Wood Sonnet. This is the story of a girl I had, or else a tale of how that girl had me. She took me to her bachelorette pad. I found it decorated Nordically. She offered me a seat and poured some wine. There were no chairs. I plopped down on the floor to drink and chat and hope she'd soon be mine. But this, alas, was not my night to score. At 2 a.m., she said, it's time for bed, but not for sex. She chose to sleep alone. Off to her bath I slunk to lay my head. Next morning when I woke, this bird had flown. I torched her flat. The flames that I ignited were hot like me, but not so unrequited. Just an innocent little rock and roll lyric. Um, this is a poem that owes a debt to Lewis Carroll's You Are Old Father William. In this poem, however, the young man is giving advice to the old guy, Father Willie. You are old, Father Willie. I'd like to propose that you find a new way to keep fit. A yoga head stands an undignified pose. You should not be indulging in it. That girl on your arm, she's a gold digging tart. Her age is of yours a mere fraction. Pray think with your head, not with some other part that needs blue pills to keep it in action. In the 60s, you smoked an abundance of weed. Your parties were all psychedelic. A respectable pint should be all that you need for a buzz now, you bong-sucking relic. You wheeze when you toke, and you creak when you dance. When you act as if you were still young, you invite those who are to regard you askance. You can't swing as you formerly swung. And I, I guess we've established by now that I, I'm not primarily a children's poet, but I do have six grandkids now and I'd like to be able to write stuff that appeals to them. I've been trying to work up some poems inspired by nursery rhymes and fairy tales. I'm gonna try one of those out on you today. This is Three Bears. We are such decorous, well-mannered bears, not savage hunters red in tooth and claw. We sleep in beds and sit upright in chairs. The food that we prefer is cooked, not raw. Our domicile, far from a feral den, is a quaint cottage, tidy, well-nigh twee. Tamely adapted to the ways of men, we are the harmless or sign bourgeoisie. We do not let our well-reared cub run wild. He'd scorn to be a burglar or a vandal. We're shocked to find our homes been thus defiled. The pilferage, the breakage, it's a scandal. We're cuddlier than Paddington and Pooh. Our dispositions couldn't be much sweeter. But this blonde girl's behavior just won't do. As soon as she wakes up, let's kill and eat her. Kids would go for that, right? Kid, kids like the grisly stuff. I, all right, let's, um, let's finish up with an anti-poetry poem. I, I wrote this poem for, um, uh, for a contest at the British magazine, The Spectator. They were asking for poems denouncing poetry. So this is Verses Against Verses or if you prefer, verses, verses, verses. Every I am, every trochee, every anapestic joke he tries to tell is more annoying than the last one. With each spondy, with each dactyl, she seems flaky as a fractal. Are they stoned or drunk or trying to pull a fast one? When their measures wax erotic, they look weirdly unexotic. All those rhymes and rhythms they keep having fun with may be just benignly strange or may pose some grave moral danger. So beware the foolish straw their gold is spun with. Some are beat and some romantic. All their egos are gigantic. Keep your distance when they try to draw you close. Their metaphors are snares that will catch you unawares and their similes are like a fatal dose. Some are living. Some are dead, 
Some are Sylvia and Ted, and you wouldn't want to drink with them or date them. The way they play with words like a chef with dead plucked birds makes you wonder why God bothered to create them. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been a good five or six minutes of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Oh, I've, I've read a number of those poems on the page before, and it's delightful to hear them. Oh, our next reader is J.D. Smith. J.D. Smith's fourth poetry collection, The Killing Tree, was published in 2016, and he is currently seeking publishers for two additional collections. His first fiction collection, Transit, is scheduled for publication in late 2022. Smith's poems have appeared in Light and other prominent publications, including The All, that's A-W-L, The Bark, Tar River Poetry, and Terrain. His books in several genres include the humor collection Notes of a Tourist on Planet Earth, 2013, the essay collection Dowsing and Science, 2011, and the children's picture book, The Best Mariachi in the World, 2008. A list of his books to date can be found on his website at www.jdsmithwriter.com. He tweets from at smitroverse, that's S-M-I-T-R-O-V-E-R-S-E, -E, um, and works in Washington, D.C., where he lives with his very patient wife, Paula Van Lair, their conspicuously less patient companion animals, and no small amount of trepidation. J.D. Smith, welcome, and please unmute yourself before you start reading. Thank you. So, okay, so uh, thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you for organizing this. I can't organize a sock drawer. Paula can testify to that. Um, and uh, thank you to Chris. That's a tough act to follow, but I will, uh, I will do what I can here. And I will start with um, poems from light. Only one poem will not be one that has appeared in light. Um, but I will start with a few critter hues, which are clara hues, except with animal names. And, uh, and this whole reading is essentially going to be about um, animals and food and how they intersect. <clears throat> uh, and I will start with one I kind of have to start with. The armadillo makes a terrible pillow, cold, hard, and gray. It keeps walking away. And then another, uh, I, th I think David Yezzy likes this one. An oyster may be a girl or a boyster, but no one can tell by inspecting its shell. And I'll have a couple more from this page, and then I'll go into a transition here. Uh, and then rabbits have quite simple habits. They hop, sleep, eat, and then repeat. Sheep who can't get to sleep count people before they slumber and snore. And one last critter hue before I transition here, and this is Cape Rhyme. The billy goat is forbidden to vote. He'd munch on the ballots like so many shallots. And um, then also a po another poem from Light, uh, the jellyfish. It has no fins and has no scales. It has no tail and has no head. Furthermore, the way it stings, I wouldn't put it on my bread. And, uh, 
Let's see. Um, then I will do a poem from uh, a, a sequence I had in life called Catalogs for Food Lovers. And this is the catalog for Hickory Farms, uh, which I, I suspect many of you have seen or walked through a mall store. But I, I think this will cover the topic somewhat. It starts with meat and ends with meat, with more meat in the middle. The pleasure offered on each page are not those of a riddle. There's meat for holidays and gifts. There's meat for many reasons. A summer sausage big enough to last for several seasons. And sausages of lesser heft. Some now are made of turkey, along with packages of plain and teriyaki jerky. Salamis in bouquets and flights include both dry and truffle, such as will make you understand what made the trained pig snuffle. This feet of meat, replete with meat, is fortified by cheese, as Gouda Cheddar Jack complete the fat and protein teas. Beef Wellingtons of order of size serve less committed snackers in league with sweet and salty nuts and golden toasted crackers. You can find several kinds of fruit to help you fight off scurvy, but if you live on their prime stock, you'll end up mighty curvy. Uh, do I have time for one more? Okay, this is a villanelle with apologies to the late uh, Dylan Thomas. Um, we must take courage in these dark days. <laughs> do not throw bento into that food fight. <laughs> do not throw bento into that food fight. No sage would add sashimi to the fray. Gauge, gauge what kind of viand should take flight. Though pies men make of cream are hurled in spite, because these men have other cravings, they do not throw bento into that food fight. Rude men who save fast only that they might let sail sous vide, perhaps green crudité, gauge, gauge what kind of viand should take flight. Rude men who fought and sang with appetite and send in haste rare morsels on their way, do not throw bento into that food fight. Brave men, hot breathed, who see it as their right to seize both fish and flesh as missiles for their prey. Gauge, gauge what kind of viand should take flight. And you, my brother, there in your mad plight, confess what waste would pierce you with dismay. Do not throw bento into that food fight. Gauge, gauge what kind of viands should take flight. Thank you. John, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Um, wow, I can't believe we're on to our last reader already. Um, but I'm very excited to welcome Gail White. Gail has been part of the formalist poetry movement from its beginning has outlived some of its journals and still submits to all she can find. She is proud to be a contributing editor of Light and also a frequent contributor to Lighten Up Online, our friendly overseas rival. Her book, Asperity Street, and her chapbook, Catechism, can be found on Amazon. She is the resident cat lady of Brobridge, Louisiana. Gail, welcome, and make sure you're unmuted, please. Oh boy, I hope Gail is still with us. We did have some connection issues. Hang on a second, I am getting a call. I'm getting a call from Gail White. I'm gonna mute myself, I'll be right back. And so I'm going to begin with two poems from Gail's collection, Catechism. And the first one is called 
fat cat. Fat cat. My cat, no lassie, looks at me with eyes whose green tranquility could watch me drown as long as she had just been fed. She ought to be a grand Episcopalian cat with blue jay feathers on her hat, who flips her furs across the pew, complacently ignoring you. A cat who gets her every wish, who knows what wine to have with fish, imposingly, serenely fat, a white-gloved southern lady cat. For cats who have a sense of worth, there is no higher form of birth. We rather may anticipate to reach the nobler feline state where fame and wealth are trivial things, to purr on popes and shed on kings. Cats, dogs, and Plato. Cat is a mistress in a new mink stole. Dog, a clown who begs for a drink. Desire and pursuit of the whole is love, says Plato. Dog might think that you alone can complete his soul, but cat will calculate the link between desire and self-control. Cat writes her love with invisible ink. Dog love is meek. Cat love is tough. Cat thinks you'll do, but she might look higher. Dog never thinks he's loved enough. His heart is a nodule of desire, but cat is whole in herself. And that is why we grovel for love from a cat. And now I, it is my delight, although I wish I could be hearing Gail read these herself, and I hope we all will hear that at some point. I know I would not mind a reprise, say, next week. Um, but I'm going to read um, two of Gail's poems. Um, Gail has become kind of the Boswell of Florida woman, who, as you might guess, is the counterpart to that famed winner of Darwin Awards, Florida Man. The first poem, these are both based on actual news stories within the last year, year and a half. The first one is Gatorade, Gator Aid. And here's the story that a quote from the story that inspired it. Florida woman whips Gator out of her pants when cops ask if she if she has anything else on her. When you've explored the local lakes to swipe some turtles, frogs, or snakes, and as you leave, abysmal luck, the cops arrive and stop your truck, unearth your your loot, and bag the lot and ask you if that's all you've got. Don't leave protection up to chance. Keep a gator in your pants. A foot long gator makes a nice female security device. Just make sure you win his trust before you hide him in your bust. Or ward off sexual attacks by taping him inside your slacks. Before the villain can advance, whip that gator from your pants. And last but not least, Further Adventures of Florida Woman. Here's the epigraph for this one. A Florida woman freed herself from a camel by biting its testicles at the Tiger truck stop in Gross Teat, Louisiana. So just to make clear, this happened in Louisiana, but it was Florida Woman. Further Adventures of Florida Woman. If you're cornered by a camel and you cannot climb the walls, when the creature settles on you, you can bite him in the balls. If you're looking at a camel, do not throw him doggy treats, then go sneaking under fences just to notice what he eats. 
camels justly get offended when you crawl into their pen, and the one that's sitting on you may not let you up again. Still, you have the useful knowledge, though applying it appalls, that to get a camel going, you can bite him in the balls. Okay, and that is, um, that is it for Gail's poems, and I'm unmuting you so you can applaud for Gail. Yay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gail, I really, really hope we will get to hear you read these sometime soon. Um, I know I'm a poor substitute. Um, I'm seeing Gail. Gail has reappeared. Yes. Hello. Hello. You're back. You see you at least, Gail. Want to say hello? <laughs> yeah. My <laughs> Nice. Do you want to read one more poem? Do you have another poem with you that you could read? Uh, uh, I cannot hear you or see you, uh, but my screen is still frozen. Okay, um, well, sadly, no, I guess not today. Um, but anyway, um, it's been wonderful. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to mute everybody again so that I can hear. Um, so that nobody's getting too much interference. Um, okay, okay, sorry about the cacophony. Um, I was just saying, A, how much I've enjoyed all of your readings, um, and B, Gail, I'm sorry that your, your tech is not working, but hopefully we can have you back to read a couple more poems at some point in this series. I would love that. I know everybody here would love that. Um, and um, again, I want to announce our readers for next week. If I can find my page. Okay, here we go. Our readers for Sunday, May 24th will be Robert Crawford, Midge Goldberg, Jean L. Creeling, Leslie Mansour, Christopher Scribner, and Karen Peterson. Um, it's been wonderful to see all of you guys today. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. And um, be well until then, please, everybody, um, and take care. And we can, I'm going to unmute you if people want to have like a little social minute before they go away. Um, so let me do that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Melissa. Melissa. Thank you very Thank much. Melissa, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Melissa, for.